when I say uh, ICE engine, what, what does ICE stand for? It's an acronym. What does it stand for? Inter. Uh, don't say it. You got to type it in the chat. There we go. ICE stands for internal combustion engine. Good job, guys. So, <clears throat> so in today's world, we have a car, a lot of cars that are powered by different things. Uh, one of those different things is natural gas. Um, that's an internal combustion engine. We have electric cars now. Um, the electric cars use an electric motor, not an engine. Um, and then your hybrids are referred to as the, the engine, the gasoline engine part is referred to as an ICE engine. So in the, if you're working for a major manufacturer, that's how they're going to refer to that engine. So we're going to talk about tonight a little bit about internal combustion engines and, and, and uh, external combustion engines as well. Can somebody tell me what is an external combustion engine? Give me an example of an external combustion engine. There you go, steam engine, right? Anything else? Sterling engine, there we go, all right. All right, I got a video of a Sterling engine I'm gonna show you guys tonight, so good deal. There's two, there's two types of internal combustion engines that are typically used in cars. Um, what is the name of the reciprocating component in an internal combustion engine? Okay, so the crankshaft is going to be a rotating part. A piston is the part that reciprocates. So the rotating part goes around and around. The reciprocating part goes up and down or side to side. You guys follow? Good job. Um, so there's another type of engine, internal combustion engine. Boxer has entered the chat. <laughs> there's an internal combustion engine that does not have any reciprocating components. Is that a rotary engine? Oh, wait, yes, it. Henry. Damn it, sorry, I shouldn't have said it. That's all right, that's all right. That would be your rotary engine, also known as a Wankel, the old Wankel engine, okay? So internal combustion engines typically take that form for the automobile. If we were in the, um, if we were in the aviation program, we'd be also talking about uh, turbine engines, right? Like jet engines that, that compress the gas um, in a turbine. So, so that's uh, the type of comp uh, internal combustion engines that we're gonna be dealing with. Uh, when we're talking about piston engines, how do we ignite the fuel in a piston engine? Anybody? Type it in there, please. Spark, spark, spark. A lot of sparkies. I saw two, two people said the other option. The other option is compression. What would we call an engine? Oh, there it is, Henry, Henry put it out there. Compression cause diesel, right? So diesel engine, a diesel engine uses compression to ignite the fuel. So let me ask this. I know it's boring just watching me talk here. I'm gonna, I, I promise I'm gonna stop talking here in a minute. But when we're talking about a diesel engine, what is it exactly that ignites the fuel? Who can, who can type in the chat there to tell me what is it that causes the fuel to ignite? The heat rod thing. Well, only when the diesel's cold, it's called the a glow plug or heating element. Okay, Hunter says high compression. Hunter, can you elaborate or can somebody help him elaborate? 
what does high compression have to do with igniting the fuel in a diesel engine? Volatility question mark. I, I think you're thinking uh, along the, the, the right lines there. I'm going to guess that somebody in this chat has a air compressor in their garage, right? So your air compressor takes air that's at atmospheric pressure. And what does it do with that air? Go ahead and shout it out, somebody. The compression causes heat, which lights the fuel. So, so how does compression cause heat? So let's, I wanna to try to elaborate on this a little bit. I actually forgot the answer to that question. What's getting hot? The, the air? The air gets hot. Why does it get hot? Pressure, but uh, oh, wait. Uh, it's being compressed. Less. Say it again, Omar. It's being compressed. It's being compressed, but what exactly does it? Can anybody tell me exactly what ha is happening to the air as it's being compressed? Becoming more dense. It becomes more dense, right? The air is made up of what, guys? <clears throat> the M word. Molecules. Mo molecules. So as we squeeze that air into a tighter space, those molecules start crashing together. As they crash together, I like to think of it as like friction, right? The air molecules have all this friction on them because they're getting squeezed into this tiny space. So as we squeeze air into a smaller space, the temperature of that air goes up. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone ever felt the tank on their air compressor after it's been running for a few hours? It gets hot. It gets hot, right? But the air coming out of the nozzle, is it hot or cold? It's usually cold. Why does the air, it's hot when it's in the tank, but when it comes out of the nozzle, it becomes cold? The release of pressure. As the pressure goes down, the temperature goes down. As the pressure goes up, the temperature goes up. So this is, this is physics, right? So your book in chapter 12 is going to talk in depth about the temperature, pressure, um, the, the pressure temperature relationship. And this is something we need to understand when we're working on engines and building engines, because we're going to have things that um, we're going to have things that we're talking about, such as compression ratio, um, pre-ignition or pinging and other conditions where uh, temperature and pressure um, are gonna give us some some foundational knowledge to help us understand what's happening in that engine. Does this make sense? Uh -huh. Are there yeah. any questions? Are there any questions up to this point? Does diesel diesel ignites from pressure, but does um, does it get really hot when it gets then when it goes to the engine? How does how does that work? Because I understand it runs under more compression than a regular right, so engine. Right. So as we squeeze the air, what happens to the temperature of the air? It gets much higher. It gets much hotter, right? So a diesel engine will have a compression ratio of like seventeen to one or twenty to one. Wow. That means it's squeezing twenty parts of air into one part. So imagine taking the volume of air of, of a uh, 20, let's see, a two liter bottle, right? You guys have all seen a two liter soda bottle? Yeah. Right? If you took all that air and squeezed it down into, into 0.2 liters, what's 0.2 liters? That's like tiny little bit of that bottle. You squeeze all that air into a little tiny space, that air is gonna get really hot. 
at super high pressure, around 500 PSI. It's gonna get so hot, in fact, that the diesel fuel, which is combustible, not flammable, you could put a match to diesel fuel and it will not ignite. So it's combustible. So it requires high pressure, high temperature for it to ignite. So in a diesel engine, we squeeze the air and then after the piston reaches the position that we want, we inject the fuel at the proper time to build the most power. So diesels have direct injection. Any other questions? On pressure um, and temperature? Go ahead. I might have I might have uh, gone over it and you might have already said it, but why do things get hotter when you compress them? So air is made up of what class? Molecules. So think of these molecules, as you squeeze them together, they're crashing together. Every time these molecules crash, it's like creating friction, right? So if you rub your hands together, they're gonna get hot. These molecules get rubbed together or pushed together, they get really hot. So it's, and it doesn't matter, it could be, it could be air, it could be propane, right? When you pressurize a propane bottle, it gets warm when you let the air out of, or when you let the gas out of a propane bottle, like if you're barbecuing, put your hand on that propane bottle. What happens to the bottle? Anyone ever, it gets cool. cold. Okay, so if you're, I don't know if anyone ever uh, has dealt with those patio heaters or they have a, a propane barbecue at home. Before you shut that thing off, put your hand on the bottle. It's gonna feel cool. Sometimes it gets cold, it'll get frost on it because the temperature inside that bottle is dropping. Uh, the pressure is dropping and the temperature is dropping. But when you charge the propane bottle, the temperature goes up and the pressure goes up. So this is just something that happens with gas and the air that we breathe is considered a gas. So does that, does that uh, Henry, does that answer your question? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. You're welcome. So when we squeeze this gas into a combustion chamber, we ignite it. And when we ignite it, it releases its energy, right? Because this gas or this air, <clears throat> we introduce a fuel to that air and then we ignite it and it releases that energy. So when it releases the energy, it like it's an explosion. Where does the energy go? Um, it's put into you pushing the piston back down as part of the path of least resistance, right? It pushes the piston downwards towards bottom dead center, right? So yes, it's the path of least resistance. So this is the, um, this is the principle that we use with, uh, when we're talking about internal combustion engines, we have increases in pressure, which we call thermal expansion, and that's what creates the force that pushes the piston down in the cylinder. Any questions? So it's like the four stroke cycle. It's exactly the four stroke cycle. So the power stroke is the stroke when the gas is expanding. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, it does. So I'm going to show you let's see here. Oh see, I lost my screen here. Bear with me one minute while I pull up the image I wanted to show you guys. Come on, chapter 12, there you are. I published chapter 12, by the way, so that you guys can see um, see everything that I'm talking about. So uh, if, you, if you've purchased your book, then you should be good to go. So, let me share my screen. 
Are there any questions at this point? Mm, no. Okay, stop me if I'm going too fast, guys, okay? I don't wanna leave anybody behind. So this is the temperature pressure relationship. So this is on the left side, we're looking at an airtight plunger, an airtight container, temperature and pressure. So as we apply force to the air in this chamber, the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. As we release the pressure, the temperature goes down, the pressure goes down. You guys see how that works? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so then I have another image. Can you guys see this image? Yep. With the yeah. candles, yeah. you see the candles? Uh-huh. Yeah. So when we heat it up, see here, we're leaving the pressure the same. The only difference now is we're applying heat, right? So when we apply heat energy to that air, the temperature rises as well as the pressure. When we reduce or remove the heat, the temperature decreases, the pressure decreases. You guys follow? Yeah. Okay, the, and I hope this all makes sense. These are the basic basic uh, physics that that are required to understand what's happening in an engine when it fails. Now, everybody's seen that old timer who can hear an engine drive down the street and they're like, oh, I know what's wrong with that engine. I do it pretty often now. I am an old timer now, right? I'm in, I, I, I'm, I'm getting to that age now where I just hear things and I know, right? So the reason we know is because we understand these principles and we understand how, how each change affects the process of combustion. So when you become a tune-up technician or a smog technician, you will learn more and more and more about how this process works. Any questions? Is the ratio between heat and pressure constant? Because I noticed that the pressure changes when more heat is applied. Is that like a direct ratio or can it change? Or is that if you apply X amount of pressure, it'll always be X amount more heat. And if you apply X amount more heat, you'll get that exact different pressure. <clears throat> I don't know the answer, the exact answer to your question, but I do know this. I know that they put nitrogen in tires versus atmospheric air because nitrogen will not expand as rapidly as regular air. And nitrogen has a larger molecule, so it won't leak out as fast. So having that knowledge tells me that there is no specific relationship to the temperature and pressure um, because it's gonna be different for every gas is what I believe. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I mean, you know, I'm gonna put that in my notes. Um, temperature. Pressure relationship. I'm going to review the book too and see if it's in there for different gases. I'm going to take a look and see if I can give you guys the answer for that. Okay. It might be in an email, but I'll get it to you guys. Okay. I just, I was curious. I thought that was interesting. I, I think that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I know that we use nitrogen like in our off road shocks or any racing shock, we use nitrogen, right? Because it's a better gas for, for heavy duty use. Um, it does not absorb heat as much as, as, as um, your regular air will, right? We use oxygen for different purposes besides breathing, right? We use oxygen in welding. Uh, we use acetylene. Uh, acetylene in, in the welding world comes in a different shaped bottle than oxygen comes in, right? Because all these gases have different reactions uh, to different pressures and whatnot. So I think that's an interesting question. I'll see if I can get a little more detail about that. Okay. Can you guys see this new image? Yep. Yeah. Sure. So here, 
we're taking temperature out of the equation, right? Now we're just looking at volume and pressure. So as the volume decreases, the pressure increases, right? So visualize the image on your left, visualize that being a piston moving in a cylinder. Both valves are closed, that piston is squeezing the air fuel mixture into the combustion chamber, right? So that's a, uh, that's what another one of our physics uh, temperature, pressure, volume uh, relationships. And then as the volume increases, the pressure decreases. Okay. Any questions on this image? All right. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, I think. going to stop sharing. Um, so we talked about pressure and volume. We talked about thermal expansion. We talked about uh, pressure, temperature. We talked about ice engines, okay? So I'm gonna have to pick up the pace here a little bit. What time are we at? Okay, we're going to keep going here. So let's talk about, right, right now we're kind of covering all the physics. So I have a video I'm going to show you guys. Are there any questions up to this point? Under general resources, I'm putting some support videos. This video is available to you on the. Um, I have a question. Are you are you gonna post a lecture videos? Because I know Mr. Kennedy does that. Are you yes, the and that's or? what I was saying at the beginning. Is I have the uh, first two videos. I haven't been able to. Um, I haven't been able to post them yet. So I was going to talk to Mr. Kennedy about how he's posting the videos like what if he's used is he using youtube or is he posting yeah. just on zoom i think he posts them first on youtube and then on zoom yeah he does use youtube okay so if they're on youtube i know how to do that i was thinking that the teachers were doing something else so i want to stay consistent so if that's what they're doing i'll just add them to my youtube channel that's a piece of cake all right so let's see right. let me go back to this window And then I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share sound, optimize for video. And here's the first video I'm going to show tonight, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Energy, work, and power. Let me maximize it and play. Oh, I have it on mute. Talk about energy, work. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and today I'm going to talk about energy, work, and power. Now, what is something that has energy? It's a pretty big term. So what things have energy? Well, we would say something in motion or something due to its position. We could say that electricity is a form of energy. We could say that um, matter can contain energy within its chemical bonds or light has energy or sound has energy. So that's a lot of different things. What is energy? Energy, therefore, is the ability to do work. Well, that's one of those definitions that requires us to dig a little bit deeper. What is work? Work in science is simply a force times a distance. So anything that can apply a force over a given distance is said to contain energy. And we measure that in joules. So work is measured in, in joules. And so let's give an example. Let's say, for example, that you want to take a can of Coke and you want to carry it to the top of a set of stairs. Well, that can of Coke has 4.0 newtons of weight. And let's say that you have to climb up a set of stairs that is 3.0 meters high. Now, the interesting thing is that since the gravitational force is always acting down, it doesn't matter if you get 
uh, to the top of the stairs by walking upstairs or get to a similar distance by climbing up a ladder or simply just throwing the can of coke up to that point. If you've moved it up a certain amount of uh, distance, we'll call that 3.0 meters, then you've done 4.0 newtons times 3.0 meters or 12 joules of work to get that to the top. Now, you could get that to the top in a couple of different ways. Let's say that we were to gradually make our way to the top of the stairs, or we were to run up the stairs. Well, we would be doing the same amount of work depending on if we're running or going slowly. And so we need another term to figure out how fast we're doing that, and that's called power. And so power is defined as the amount of work in a given period of time. And let's say, so let's say that you were to go up that set of stairs with that can of Coke and you were to do that in one second. Well, the amount of work we have is going to be 12 joules and the amount of time is going to be one second. And so the power of that is going to be 12 watts or W-A-T-T-S or watts is going to be the amount of power that we have. If you were to do that slower, so let's say we were to do that in 10 seconds, then the amount of watts would drop from 12 watts to 1.2 watts. So that's, that's really not that much power. And so the amount of power that we're actually used to dealing with here in the U.S. is horsepower. And so horsepower is measured it measures the amount of work that we can do in a given period of time. We use it in engines, for example. And so the conversion is one horsepower is roughly 746 watts. And so let's go back to that problem. If we're able to move a can of Coke to the top of the stairs in one second, we say that that's a 12 watts. Um, so if we convert that to horsepower, then we are a .004 horsepower machine. So that's not a very uh, powerful machine. Now the one thing that you should realize is not only are we moving that can of Coke to the top of the stairs, but we're also moving our weight, our whole body to the top of the stairs. And so maybe we're a little more powerful than we think. Hi, I'm Brad Callen, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how anyone... All right, so questions. We slow climbing up the stairs. <laughs> that was just an example. Um, <laughs> that was just an example, of course. Um, so the truth for me is I never remember the formula for energy, power, and um, and and um, and work. So or, or force, work, and power. So I always have to look up that formula. Um, the whole idea is you recognize that when we're talking horsepower, what that means is the amount of time it's taking to get from point A to point B, right? And, and, and that time with uh, more, the, the faster that happens, there's more work being done, which is going to equate to, in your, in your math, it's going to equate to more power and more force. So when we're talking about the force work power relationship, I'm going to leave that video up there for you guys to review it. If you want to see it again, it'll be up there all semester. Um, that's, that's going to be something that um, we just need to understand. I don't really have any um, ex experiments or, or projects that are directly related to that, but we do need to understand that power is distance times force divided by time in minutes, okay? And then work is the distance moved, how far times how much force was applied. And force is what causes movement or creates work, okay? And the speed that this force happens is power. So they're all three related. So if you've taken electrical class, and you've studied Ohm's law, this law is very similar to Ohm's law. The difference is we're talking about uh, power in an engine versus um, electron flow. You guys with me? Yeah. Any oh, so questions? Just to, uh, yeah, just to double check, because I was about to type it in chat so I could remember it better. It's power equals distance times force divided by time, right? Let's see if I can put it in the chat for you guys. Okay. I, I have it in my notes here.
Um, in this context, what is the relation? What is the difference between? I know it's such an easy question, but I always mess this one up. What's the difference between horsepower and torque in this context? So here we go. So torque is um, so power is distance and force. So torque is going to be referred to as force. Oh. Okay. So yeah, force. Yeah. Isn't it like uh, the the foot pedal of force, like with the garage or something like that? Yes. Yeah, so when we're using a torque wrench, we're talking about force, right? So so force. So here's the notes that I just posted in the chat. It says force. It equals effort. This tends to cause movement, which creates work. The speed at which this happens is known as power. So force, um, let me make an example for you. Does anybody have a, a newer diesel truck, like for towing, or know somebody who does? Yeah, I know somebody. Right? So, so if it's a newer truck, what kind of horsepower and torque does that newer diesel make? Well, um, he has like a tune in an emissions delete, but his okay. Like, so his, his truck it makes like five hundred uh, horsepower and like like fifteen hundred foot pounds of torque or something like right. that. Okay, so that's that's amazing, right? So five hundred yeah. horsepower and fifteen hundred foot pounds of torque. Probably that truck will out accelerate any of your cars. You guys yeah. with me? He drag races a lot of like sports cars. Yeah, and he probably beats them, right? Yeah, not even close. 20 years ago, a truck that was designed for towing still might have 800 to 1,000 foot-pounds of torque with like 120 horsepower, right? So it could still pull the same amount of weight, and it's so, which means that it has lots of torque. It can still do the same amount of work. It just takes longer. Right, so if I took that 20 year old diesel truck and pulled the same trailer, I'm not gonna get to the top of the hill as fast as doing it with the newer newer truck that has 1500 foot pounds of torque and 500 horsepower. You guys with me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so think of a carriage being pulled by one horse and a carriage being pulled by three horses. Three horses are gonna get the work done much faster. So that's what we're talking about as far as power goes. Um, force is how much work is being done, right? We're moving the same wagon up the hill, right? It's the same amount of weight, but with three horses, you're getting it done faster. Do you guys follow? Yeah, is that why um, low displacement, high revving engines make a lot of power, but not torque? The, cylinder, the actual engine rotation has a high amount of distance moved but not a lot of force applied that's exactly why yeah so so the different engine designs have a lot to do with what the engine was built for right so formula one car engine will have a lot of horsepower but very little torque it doesn't need very much torque because how much does that car weigh 1200 pounds it doesn't weigh anything right so so a formula one engine will produce gobs of power um, but a Cummins engine and a new Ram pickup, that thing has to pull horse trailers and car trailers and everything else. Um, it's going to have a lot of torque. You guys follow? Uh -huh. Okay. So it says torque and power produced by an engine are called engine output. Um, engine power is measured by the amount of torque or turning effort applied to the crankshaft multiplied by the RPM at which it is turning divided by uh, 5,252, okay? This is gonna be in your, in your notes, guys, for uh, in the CDX book, okay? So, so if you're taking notes, that's good. Um, this, this document is available to you guys through Canvas on CDX, okay? Um, so engine power is measured by the amount of torque. Torque and power produced by an engine are called engine output. Horsepower refers to the speed at which the torque is produced, right? So how fast are we getting, getting it done? Load factor refers to the period of time a vehicle can operate at a maximum speed. I'm going to post this for you guys again anyways. How about that?
Okay, you guys could take a look at that chat there. Okay, I just added some more notes there. This and the reason I'm adding notes because this stuff's a little bit complex, right? Um, to try to wrap your head around around all these different forces and things that are happening. So I definitely want to give you guys the benefit of a doubt. Okay. I'll give you guys a minute to read that. So it says load factor refers to the period of time a vehicle can operate at maximum speed and power. Has anyone bought a power tool from Harbor Freight? And it says like, it'll say uh, duty cycle 20% or duty cycle 80%. Has anyone ever seen that? I haven't. Yeah. So sometimes when you buy cheaper tools, um, those tools, cheaper power tools, it'll say something like duty cycle 80%. So what that means is for every 60 minutes of operation, uh, it should be resting 80% 80 80 of 60 is like uh, 45 to 50 minutes of use. It's gonna have to rest for 10 to 15 minutes for every, every hour of use. Um, Otherwise, that, ma you, you, that machine will overheat or overload. Um, the only welder I have at my house is a Harbor Freight flux core welder. I just use it for little projects around the yard and whatnot. And it has a like a, I don't know, a 20% duty cycle. So if, if I'm welding for 20 minutes, I got to wait another 20 to 30 minutes for that thing to like cool off before I can start welding again because it'll overheat. So if I'm doing a lot of welding, that's something to take into consideration. The load factor on a car is kind of the same thing, right? So this is the period of time it can operate at maximum speed and power. Usually the limiting factor is space, right? Most of the time we don't have the space to drive that car to its full capacity for more than a minute at a time, if that. But what happens is the cooling system might not be able to maintain 200 miles an hour for 15 minutes. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Right, the radiator will overheat. There's not enough water volume. There's not enough airflow. So those cars, these cars that we have, that we drive, uh, they're designed for a load factor that, that works, right? So let's say you're going to Vegas in the summertime uh, it's 120 degrees outside, you're going 80 miles an hour. A new car has got a load factor designed into it that can take that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But if you're doing like 120 and it's 120 outside, that might be a little too much for the car. So that's what they're talking about when they say load factor. All right. In the chat, when I say TDC, what do I, what do I mean? Very good. And when I say BDC, that means what? Bottom dead center. Very good. All right. Um, Excellent. Does, does the ahead. fuel of a vehicle factor into its load factor? Like people were saying that when the original Bugatti Veyron came out, they said, oh, if you drive it at top speed, it'll run out of fuel in 15 minutes. Does that affect the load factor? Um, no, because I, I don't think it's running out of fuel because it's using so much. Um, I think the load factor is more a measurement of uh, heat, heat, load, and power. Um, so let's see here. 
So I think the load factor has more to do with like the power, force, and energy um, uh, physics than oh. the amount of fuel available, right? So if you put a bigger yeah. a bigger fuel tank in the Bugatti, you you should be able to go for longer. You guys with me? So why am I? Because I keep on getting disconnected for some reason. Okay. Did you have a question, Omar? No, no, I'm just saying that why I miss because like I, I keep on getting disconnected because my for some reason my internet is shit right now. <laughs> That's all right. So hey, I'm recording it right now. If you if you if you um, go to the chat, I posted some notes in there. We're just kind of discussing the notes that I posted in the chat. So we're talking yeah. about force, power, um, um, things like I guess, that. I guess since I joined again, the chats are are gone for me. Like I, I see blank. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to put, I'll repost this uh, recording here so that you guys will have access to it. Okay. And because, um, because right now we're, we're, we've been going at it for an hour. I want to give you guys, oh, somebody just reposted it for you. So go okay, ahead. Thank you. Link, Omar. thank you guys. See, you guys think so much faster than I do. <laughs> I'll just um, write that in my notes real quick. So, um, so here's the deal guys. It's 716. I want to give you guys about 10 minutes to stretch because we're, we're kind of going to go do a marathon tonight because I want to get you guys prepped for this, uh, for getting to the lab. And really the place I want to go um, is I want to start talking about diagnosing engines and, and um, all this pressure temperature relationship stuff is going to be relevant to, to that. So um, my clock says 717 right now. Let's see here, there should be. Well, I don't see what I was looking for, but that's okay. We're gonna do a, um, we're gonna do a 10 minute break. I'm gonna stop recording.